Welcome to the 2022 Candidates Debate, moderated by the nonpartisan League of Women Voters of New Canaan. Candidates, thank you for being here tonight. We are grateful to Town Hall for allowing us to use this space and to NCTV Channel 79 for the production of the debate. Voters, we know your time is precious, so this year we are hosting five separate debates so you can watch only the races applicable to you. A reminder that edited or partial usage of tonight's program is not permitted. For the first time at one of our debates, we are excited to welcome a select group of seniors from New Canaan High School debate team. They got to meet our candidates earlier and they will be presenting the debate questions throughout the evening. It is heartwarming to know that when asked, these students enthusiastically raised their hands and we're excited about participating in our democracy. Our hope is that by having these students here, more citizens, both young, old, and in between, will tune in, get informed, and vote. Questions for tonight's debate were submitted to the League from the public in advance. I wanna thank everyone who took the time to let us know the issues they cared about most this election. In accordance with our nonpartisan guidelines, our carefully selected team reviews the questions and often rewrites them. That we rewrite them for comprehensiveness, fairness, nonpartisanship, applicability to all candidates, and relevance to the office. The candidates have agreed to a set of debate rules for the evening. While our students will present the questions, I will remain here and be responsible for enforcing the rules, including time limitations, but I'm sure it won't come to that. Without further ado, I would like to introduce May Campbell from the New Canaan High School debate team who will ask the questions for this debate. Welcome to the candidate debate for Representative District 125, serving voters in parts of Darien, New Canaan, and Stanford. Our candidates are Tom O'Day and Victor Alvarez. The debate will begin with opening statements followed by questions submitted by the public. Candidates will be allowed a one and a half minute response followed by an optional 30 second rebuttal. We will end with closing statements. Based on random draw, we begin with opening remarks from Tom O'Day. Thank you very much, League of Women Voters. Uh, it's been an honor representing New Canaan these past 10 years. And while I'm proud of the things I've accomplished so far, like the 20, 2017 Republican-based budget and the opioid legislation that has saved thousands of lives, just to name two, there's still more issues I'd like to address, particularly now that I'm in leadership as the number two House Republican, like securing local control of zoning, fixing 830G, securing local control of our state's number one educational system, and two, making Connecticut more affordable by lowering taxes for working individuals, retirees, and businesses, and three, making Connecticut more business friendly. We are the only state that had more jobs in 2008 than today. I'm extremely proud of my bipartisan reputation. If you ask any Democrat in the House who the most bipartisan Republican is, I would be at the top of that list. How do you know that? Well, I've been unopposed by a Democratic opponent more often than not in the last 10 years. Chris Hussey was my mentor and seatmate when I was on the town council, and I have many Democrats, both pro-life and pro-choice, who have my signs on their lawn. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Victor Alvarez, your opening statement. Both my parents fled communist Cuba in 1960. I was raised with a keen understanding of the destruction that an authoritarian dictator can unleash on a seemingly well-functioning society. I take January 6th very seriously. Silence is not an option. When Republicans like Cassidy Hutchinson and Liz Cheney risk their political careers to uphold our democracy, it's nothing short of patriotic. This country has given so much to my family and me, and now I'm in a position to give back by giving voters an alternative at the polls. Connecticut's financial health is rebounding strongly, and I have 32 years of experience as a financial professional. So I'm familiar with budgeting, containing costs and delivering solutions that work. I have had over a thousand conversations with voters to find out what is important to you and I, so I can better represent you if elected. Thank you. All right, thank you. We'll start with our first question for Tom O'Day. 30 years after statute 830G on affordable housing was enacted, less than a quarter of Connecticut towns meet the target for having 10% of housing stock deemed affordable. What do you think are reasonable affordable housing goals for Connecticut and how would you achieve them? That's a very good question and something that I'm very familiar with. Over the 10 years that I've been in Hartford, Republicans have proposed many changes to 830G. 830G has been in place for many, many years, decades, and it's a one, 
one policy to fit all just doesn't work. They require 10% affordable housing, and that should not be the case. Each municipality should be looked at based on its percent development and its population, and frankly, what it's done. New Canaan has done an outstanding job, frankly, of at least trying to do something. Uh, Laszlo Papp instituted the fee on attached to every building permit to raise money to have affordable housing built and renovated. We've renovated all of our affordable housing over the last five to 10 years, and we've doubled our affordable housing stock. We obviously can do better, but 830G is being used as a predatory, uh, by predatory builders to try and uh, increase their profits. And so I think what we need to do is fight, fight 830G proposals like what's going on at Weed Street in four ways. One, try and figure out a solution uh, to our affordable housing issue. 830G does not solve that. 830G, frankly, puts money in the pockets of developers and does not encourage putting in more affordable housing. So I think if we tailor it to have lower percentage of affordable housing requirements, that we'll do much better in uh, getting affordable housing going forward. Thank you. Victor Alvarez, your response? Your Since 2016, I've been on record about being against overdevelopment. When I was the condo board president in the condos next to the view on Park Street in New Canaan, I vehemently opposed this project by speaking at New Canaan planning and zoning meetings. The project removed 38 units of naturally occurring affordable housing and replaced them with over 100 very expensive units. The developer got the planning and zoning approval by threatening the town with a large affordable housing project in its place. I preferred affordable housing. My opposition was based on the scale, the look, and the expensive prices of the individual units. I think most of us agree that providing affordable housing in town strengthens our community. But we've had 830G since 1989, and it hasn't changed. It needs to be fixed. I would change the percentage of the, the threshold percentage from 10% to 5% for Fairfield County suburban towns. I would offer property owners tax incentives for deed restricting their rental properties, including their accessory dwelling units. And under 830G, even when developers are in a position to circumvent the local planning and zoning board, they're still subject to certain rules like coverage and setbacks. There should be an additional mandatory density restriction rule added to this list. All right, Tom O'Day, your rebuttal? Yes, yeah, so, so what have I done with regard to 830G? I've met with the chair of the housing committee. I've toured him around New Canaan for three and a half hours. He's promised me to, to propose or to allow us to have hearings on 830G and proposed changes. Republicans have, been, have put forth dozens of proposed changes, but we haven't had support on the other side of the aisle for changing 830G. We need more Republicans, quite frankly, elected up in Hartford in order to negotiate further changes to 830G. 5% is even unattainable at this point right, in time, so we you. need more changes. Thank Richard you. Alvarez, your rebuttal. Constituents are saying that 830G is one of the most important issues facing this district. My opponent's been in the seat for 10 years, and under his watch, 830G has not changed. I believe that if you send me to Hartford as a Democrat, I would join the moderate caucus, and I would have a better chance of moving the dial on this issue. And in terms of the perspective of there's too many Democrats in Hartford, I would say another perspective is that there are too many lawyers in Hartford. And in the general, uh, and they're not enough right, business thank people. You. The second question: All states need revenue to provide services. What would you change about the ways Connecticut generates its revenue, or how it spends it? Victor Alvarez. Okay, so um, for. Um, Let's start with jobs. The recent jobs outlook in Connecticut is on the upswing, um, but it is critical for the health of our economy to attract companies to Connecticut because um, companies moving to the state materially increase, materially increase our tax revenues, which means we can keep taxes flat or lower taxes for our residents. So um, I would attract companies to Connecticut by expanding the research and development tax credit to reward companies that relocate to Connecticut and generate new products through innovation. 
I would underwrite job training programs through the Office of Workflow Strategy to provide entry-level skills for jobs with a future in healthcare, technology, clean energy infrastructure, bioscience, and manufacturing, because this will attract companies to Connecticut and increase our revenues. We need to fix A30G, as we were, that was the last question um, discussed. Um, so to provide appropriate and realistic housing um, and, and attract the workforce we want to, um, to have. And, uh, and I think um, attracting, um, or the prospect of attracting renewable energy companies to Connecticut, I believe right, would, thank you. Yep, yeah, thanks. Amadei, your response? Could you repeat the question, please? Yes, all states need revenue to provide services. What would you change about the ways Connecticut generates its revenue or how it spends it? So over the last 10 years um, th that I've been in the office, the CBIA has given me virtually 100% ranking on growing small business. We have less jobs now than we had in 2008. We need to make Connecticut more affordable. Govern Governor Lamont was correct when he said that it's too hard to start a business in Connecticut. That's why his wife is starting her, bringing her business to Tennessee. Uh, Connecticut has less, like I said, less jobs that we had in 08 uh, now. And our, literally our unfunded debt has gone from $75 billion two years ago to $95 billion now. And that's because of the excess of spending. Uh, I would roll back a 10% across the board cut uh, in all of the departments, um, and I would cut taxes. I would literally, if for $500 million or less, we can make Connecticut the best place in the country to retire by eliminating the taxes on pensions, eliminating the tax on Social Security, uh, and elim eliminating the estate tax. That will increase our revenue uh, and, and make people stay in Connecticut over the long term. And it'll increase our property values dramatically. Connecticut needs to grow private sector jobs and not vote unbelievable. We've got the number one highest paid public sector in the country. We're one of the only states that the public sector makes more than the private sector for the same job. We have great public sector workers, but we can't afford to keep increasing their rate by 5%, and we can't give them bonuses Thank like they've been done. Victor Alvarez, your rebuttal. The increase in the state debt that my opponent refers to is mostly due to a change in the formula that calculates the debt. So the weighted average cost of capital was changed, and that was the material difference in why the, the debt increased recently. All right, thank you. Tom O'Day, your rebuttal? It was the 2017 budget that has created all these surpluses. William Tong called me after the governor vetoed the 2017 Republican budget and said, Tom, can we meet and try and get a bipartisan solution? Five Republicans and five Democrats, I was one of them, met and created this bipartisan budget that is now creating these surpluses. Unfortunately, our, my Democratic colleagues in Hartford have gone on a spending spree over the last five years Thank to create you. what's going on now. For the third question, Connecticut is one of the few states that does not allow no excuse early that does not allow no excuse early voting, and our legislature cannot consider early voting measures without a change to our constitution. The November 8th ballot will ask voters if they approve such a change to our state constitution. Many voters want to know if they vote yes, what early voting measures a candidate will support. What is your position on early voting, and if elected, what specific early voting measures would you support? Tom O'Day? Yes, so I do support no excuse absentee balloting. Um, and that's going to be, uh, I voted on it, and uh, that is going to eventually become part of our Constitution. Um, and that will allow anybody to vote for any reason by absentee. Uh, I do believe, though, we have to secure our absentee ballots. There was the Democratic Town Committee Chair from Stanford was convicted last month of 28 felony counts of fraud. And because of uh, abusing and harvesting absentee ballots. We've got to do more to secure those absentee ballots. I also believe we need voter uh, 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 ID. You need to show picture ID in order to vote. Um, you know, you need to get, you need to show picture ID to get medication. You need to show it to get on a plane. You need to show it to drive. Um, and so um, we need to have uh, voter identification because we need to make sure people are confident in, our, in the voting process. But I do believe in no excuse absentee uh, uh, voting. Um, 
And um, I believe that's going to happen within the next two years. Thank you. Rachel Alvarez, your response? So there are 46 states that have this early voting provision already. So it's kind of embarrassing that Connecticut is one of the four states that doesn't. Life is complicated. One day is easy to miss. Your child gets sick. You miss the train. You're called out of town for the la at the last minute. We need to find balance between making voting accessible for people while protecting our election process. Voting yes on the ballot question would give legislature, legislators the ability to deliberate over what such a system might be, but it, and it doesn't guarantee it will happen, it just starts the conversation. I would support a modest period of early voting, say three days including one weekend day. This gives some flexibility to voters, and I, it also respects election workers' bandwidth. I also support removing barriers to absentee voting for all people who are legally eligible to vote. But I would also note that Connecticut has a rigorous and effective election audit process that detects instances of fraud. The, bigger threat, the biggest threat to our election system is when a losing candidate asserts baseless claims that fraud occurred when it, in fact, did not. All right, thank you. Tom O'Day, your rebuttal. Um, I, I think it sounds like we both agree on uh, no excuse absentee balloting. Um, the, the problem with early voting would be if it were outside the town clerk's office. In other words, uh, I, I think it's something that I would look into and agree to if it was with the town clerk and the municipalities would not have additional costs associated with the early voting. Um, uh, so I think we're, we're pretty much on the same page on that. I just would not want to see uh, schools interrupted for early voting. Victor Alvarez, your rebuttal? No rebuttal. All right. Connecticut recently enacted legislation to protect the rights of persons both receiving and providing reproductive health care services and to codify access to more reproductive health care service providers. Do you support Connecticut's current position and why or what changes, if any, would you recommend? Victor Alvarez? Yeah, I definitely support Connecticut's position. Um, abortion feels safer now in Connecticut, but we can't take this or any rights for granted. The Supreme Court's move to overturn Roe v. Wade is the beginning of restrictions, not the end. I believe that women should have the right to make their own choices about their reproductive health care, not the government. Since 2014, Republicans have voted to erode Connecticut abortion laws over 30 times. For example, they promote crisis pregnancy centers that masquerade as abortion clinics, but really try to talk women out of having abortions. I will do everything in my power to safeguard Connecticut's sensible abortion laws. I would support providing improved security at Connecticut's abortion clinics. And where other rights are concerned, like marriage equality, I will work tirelessly to uphold these rights for all of us. My opponent voted no on the only abortion-related bill that came before him in the 2022 legislative session. It protects Connecticut abortion providers from pro politically motivated out-of-state lawsuits. I would have voted yes. All right, Tom O'Day? Yes, so in 1990, a group of bipartisan legislators and stakeholders, including the Hartford Archdiocese, Planned Parenthood, and Right to Life groups, got together and put forth a compromise. And that was called the Freedom of Choice Act. And that compromise allows a woman to gives the woman a right to choose up until the time of viability uh, and pass that for the health, safety, and welfare of the, of the mother. Uh, I agree with that compromise. Uh, while I am personally pro-life, um, like I said, I've got many friends and relatives, including in my own family, who are pro-choice. And I have not proposed one piece of legislation to change that compromise from 1990. Abortion is not an issue in Connecticut and will not be. Um, unlike our federal colleagues, who, back in 2006, they controlled the White House, the Senate filibuster-proof, and the House, and they made the conscious choice to not pass a codification of Roe v. Wade, unlike Connecticut, and they chose the one piece of legislation was Obamacare that they passed without a single Republican vote. They wanted it to be an election issue. Thankfully, in Connecticut, it is not an election issue. A woman's right to choose is uh, gonna continue in Connecticut, 
I would point out that I voted against the bill that expanded the access to abortions to non-doctors. I voted against that piece of legislation because it didn't help women. It was gonna, it could hurt women. There's no delay in getting an abortion for a woman in a right to right, choose, and that legislation would hurt women. Uh, Victor Alvarez, your rebuttal. Abortion is an issue in Connecticut. My opponent just admitted that he's against abortion, and he voted against the only abortion law that went before him in the 2022 legislative um, session. Normally, Republicans support the blocking of bogus lawsuits that increase costs for providers and health care recipients. But I believe my opponent voted no for this particular law for political reasons. He's hiding behind safe abortions, but we're talking about licensed professionals, not unsafe access to health care. Right, thank you. Connecticut residents have faced increased energy costs and service disruptions. What legislation would you propose to improve our energy and resource infrastructure to ensure future access and affordability? Victor Alvarez. So utility prices in general are high in Connecticut, 32% more than the national average. We suffer from transmission congestion. Connecticut's peak electricity demand is, has grown faster than the state's infrastructure of power plants. As a result, the transmission system has become increasingly congested. We should take part of the 5.4 billion in infrastructure money coming to Connecticut and invest in improving our infrastructure related to the transmission and distribution of electricity. Our reliance on fossil fuels that was supposed to make energy more affordable has resulted in increased volatility and has made our problems worse, especially with the recent invasion of the Ukraine. Utilities, utilities are the most lobbied industry in Connecticut, and the industry is controlled by Pura, a committee that is staffed by utility company executives that sets the rates charged by investor-owned utilities, a potential conflict of interest. I would like to introduce competition to, in, um, with Eversource in Connecticut, similar to what has been done in New York State. I would also explore a long-term plan to use tax incentives and rebates to underground the state's urban and suburban overhead wires in order to make the state more resilient in the face of severe weather we know is coming in the future. All right, thank you. Tom O'Day. So I'm hearing that the fossil fuels are a bad thing. I will tell you that not a single Republican voted for some legislation that's been passed in Connecticut to follow uh, California's emission standards. Unfortunately, the majority, and most of the time, legislation is bipartisan, but this is one of the situations where it was not. The majority forced through legislation that requires us to follow the emission standards of California, which, uh, and we all know the California prices are outrageous. Um, literally, California said we're gonna get rid of fossil fuel vehicles, and I'm sorry, you can't, on the same day they said, I'm sorry, you can't charge your cars, we don't have enough power to do that. Um, and so I, I propose legislation year after year to allow private investment to come in and build community solar. And every year the Democrats and the unions fight that legislation. And I'm hopeful that if we get enough Republicans voted, my legislation to promote community solar will pass and we'll have more energy generation. And if, I would also say that if it wasn't for Republicans, Millstone, the nuclear plant, would have been closed down. It's because of Republicans who have tried to promote uh, uh, community solar, uh, nuclear option, and more generation through private investment. Uh, and, and unfortunately, it's the Democrats that have fought me on that. All right, Victor Alvarez, your rebuttal. My opponent had five laws come before him over the last two years that were um, for regulating emissions and he voted no all five times. And he sits on the Environment Committee of the, of the House of Representatives. So I'm, it's, I'm, I'm a little baffled by that, but I feel like he doesn't take seriously the fact that uh, emissions pollute and it's a direct cause of climate change. Tom O'Day, your rebuttal? Yeah. So I believe in alternative fuels. I bought hybrid. I believe in solar, but we need other uh, sources. And literally, natural gas vehicles were a great thing. Unfortunately, the majority is now outlawing natural gas vehicles after Norwalk spent millions of dollars in purchasing natural gas vehicles. Uh, this administration and the legislature ended uh, incentives for putting in more natural gas throughout the state. 
we, we need to have fossil fuels until we can generate enough uh, non-emission energy. Thank you. Okay. Other than reducing taxes, what ideas can you offer for Connecticut to attract new employers, retain jobs, and make Connecticut a more affordable place to live? Tom O'Day. Other than reduce taxes? Um, could you repeat that question? Yes. Other than reducing taxes, what ideas can you offer for Connecticut to attract new employers, retain jobs, and make Connecticut a more affordable place to live? Well, we have to make opening a business easier. Uh, 2019 was the most anti-business uh, session in our, in our history. We, we put in an automatically increasing $15 minimum wage. I would at, at the very least stop the automatic increase to that. Um, they put in, the mo without a, a Republican vote, they put in the most generous paid family medical leave program in the country that even the state wasn't in compliance with. Uh, literally, an employer of two has to uh, provide 14 weeks paid vacation or leave um, for any employee that requests it for not just immediately family members. Mind you, the federal law applies to employers of 50 or more because they know that if you apply it to a small employer, it could devastate their business. But the majority, without a single Republican vote, makes it applicable to employers of two or more. Imagine running a small business when two or, or three of your employees take paid family medical leave that for, for friends, not even immediate family members. Um, look, it's a great idea, but even California puts it in the private sector with insurance. The, the, the paid family medical leave, the automatically increasing uh, minimum wage, and the weaponization of the CHRO, which is the Connecticut Commission on Human Rights and Opportunities, has been a disaster for small businesses, and we need to change that. All right, thank you. Victor Alvarez? I think improving our infrastructure is a key way to attract businesses to Connecticut. And we can do that by um, imp making improvements to Connecticut's train bridges to speed up train service. Um, I heard Governor Lamont say that thanks to the Democrats in Washington, D.C. and their infrastructure bill, we're going to take 20 minutes off the commute from Stamford to New York City. Um, so th changes like that, um, improving our electricity transmission and distribution, um, undergrounding overhead wires to make Connecticut more resilient. All of these infrastructure improvements attract companies to Connecticut and create jobs uh, and create more tax revenues. All right. Tom O'Day, your rebuttal. Look, we were going to get the, the infrastructure change and the in increased speed of the trains had nothing to do with the latest uh, infrastructure bill from, uh, from Washington. I do agree with my opponent that, that putting more money into the infrastructure is a good thing. What I disagree with him in, uh, on is, is how to implement it. We didn't need this stimulus uh, that's the reason for our um, uh, outrageous inflation. Um, our transportation fund, if it wasn't raided by the Democrats over the last 15 years, would have billions of dollars more in it for our infrastructure. All right, thank you. Victor Alvarez? I would say that inflation was caused by supply chain disruptions due to COVID and the energy price increases caused by the Ukrainian invasion by the Russians. So whenever you hear people um, giving you reasons th um, that inflation is skyrocketing, skyrocketing because of the Democrats, you should be a little suspicious. All right. We invite our candidates to now present their closing statements, starting with Tom O'Day. As the number two House Republican who runs the floor for the Republican caucus, I communicate directly with the speaker and deputy leaders. I'm often called into the speaker's office to negotiate fixes to troublesome or problematic legislation. How did I get there? I assure you it's not because I'm a radical. I have earned my bipartisan reputation through hard work, kindness, integrity, and respect for my fellow legislators. How did I get here? I'm a trial lawyer who reads and interprets legislation every day as part of my 31 year job as a lawyer. I spent decades representing businesses, individuals, and municipalities. How did I get here? 25 years of public service. I was a member of the Police Officers Standards and Training Council, which is responsible for overseeing all training of police. I was a victim compensation commissioner uh, adjudicating claims for victims. I was appointed Judicial Selection Commission, which uh, recommends uh, the appointment of state judges. 
and I was on the Canaan's Town Council from 2005 to 2013. I am very proud of being the original proponent of outdoor dining in 2006, along with actively working on expanding sidewalks. I've volunteered many right, years with many organizations Victor Alvarez, in, in, your closing in Canaan. Statement. My opponent is unquestionably a nice guy. I like him myself, but this election isn't a popularity contest. The stakes are high given the direction that partisan politics is taking us. I have the experience, the discipline, the courage, and the work ethic to be tough in Hartford when it comes to economic issues and to take seriously and make progress on 830G, climate change, gun laws, and term limits. And I'll vigorously protect reproductive rights, marriage equality, and other human rights. I want to strengthen our culture of democracy. I want to bring both sides of the argument to the table. You give up something, I give up something, and we reach a compromise that works for people on both sides of the political spectrum and do so in a way that is earnest and decent. And I guarantee that if I am elected, my focus will be on improving the lives of the people in this district. Okay, this concludes our District 125 debate. We thank our candidates and our viewers for, for participating in democracy. Up next is Representative District 142 featuring Lucy Dathan and Don Masternardi. Thank you again, candidates, for participating tonight, and a big thank you to you, May, for volunteering and being brave enough to ask the questions for us tonight. We hope that you are inspired to become a lifelong voter. Viewers, please be on the lookout for our nonpartisan voter's guide. It should be in your mailbox soon. The voter's guide is just one of the many activities that the League does in New Canaan. The voters, sorry, including voter registration, sponsoring civics education, supporting internships and scholarships, and of course, running this debate. At a time when polarizing views and rhetoric can be the norm, it is wonderful to be here together tonight, hashing out issues in a civilized and thoughtful manner.